Well, hi there, everyone. It's Christy. Welcome to the April uh, Patron Hangout. Joined today by two awesome people. We've got uh, Tom, who is our perennial. I think you've been with me every month since I started, Tom. Um, Pretty close, at least, yeah. Pretty close, yes. And then joining us is, uh, you might know him from his channel, The Lonely Wolf 1980. The Lonely Wolf. Say hi to the people. <laughs> Hello, very lonely. I'm oh, not lonely anymore that I'm now that I have um, Tom and the great doctor with me. <laughs> <laughs> so before we went on air, we were just thinking about topics to discuss, and you had one that was very interesting, and I think uh, would be good to unpack and explore a little bit. So if you want to tell a little bit about, yeah, what your question was, where you come from, and then we can open the discussion once you sort of set the stage with with how you how you view things. Yes. Um. It was about the atheist community. I've never actually done a video about, because I'm non-religious myself, I don't subscribe to an organized religion, but I've always, I've had this straw man fallacy that I've kind of built up in my mind um, because it was due to the lack of not watching the videos, but I kind of had a bit of a bright spark moment I mean, when I watched a video. It was basically, um, so Christy with Micaiah and there was a lot of discussions around existentialism and that broke down a lot of um, preconceived ideas. Um, like I sort of had the impression that um, like atheism was the rejection of um, sort of spirituality, existentialism, and it was just a purely kind of scientific, um, almost a spiritually impoverished world. So I think that particular hangout really broke down that conception and it sort of made me more interested in looking at other um, content creators who do the atheism. And who else did you go, um, any names pop to mind, or have you not gone looking too far yet? I haven't gone looking too far yet, but it does give me, it, it gave me impetus to think about, um, I guess, to think about what makes a sceptic community. So, well, not, not a community per se, but um, some of the logical fallacies that we might go down. And um, I guess how I can frame my own arguments, I guess it gives me a lot more freedom to look at certain issues from that point of view as well of um of maybe thinking more existentially yeah what things about like spirituality like what's your take on it what is it um what value does it have for you i think that um sometimes there's a visceral response um like i'm a little skeptical about um other things like astrology or whatever but sometimes we face uncomfortable truths about ourselves um like I may be skeptical, but I remember having a, a full reading. And sometimes when we read the horoscopes, we read our sun sign and our earth sign or whatever, and we see the elements that we like. And I'm thinking because I'm very much earth and um, earth and air signs as an Aquarian and Taurus. But then when they get down to the planets, like you discover the I don't know. It may have been coincidental, but there was these things that I read and. There was almost this um, emotional kind of outrage, um, guilt or whatever, and just these strong reactions. And sort of some very uncomfortable truths went that you face about yourself. And it kind of relates to discourse as well. Um, so sometimes when we read articles um, that might call out, you know, racist behaviours or whatever, sometimes your reaction is almost a similar um, kind of existential experience. So if you feel uncomfortable or if there's an anger or if there's a guilt or whatever, then maybe the article is hitting home. But when you feel calm, when you're reading an article and you think, okay, well, it's not talking about me, so I can just relax. And that becomes, that comes the basis for a lot of very, um, almost an over emotional reaction, um, to particular videos that might talk about race or sexism, um, because it could be pointing to something that's, you know, within ourselves that's, Bias that we might have, but you need that openness to be able to see it first. Because if you react with anger, you're going to be like shutting down, right? So the self reflection or the the processing of the information mm -hmm. can take place in different ways, and that will influence how the information gets in, right? Yes. So it's, I guess, if there is a reaction, so no matter what it is, it could be um, you might be a bit pissed off about at the article, thinking. You know, I can't, like, there is a strong reaction that people have. And sometimes your your instinct is to say, um, no, we're not, no, I'm not racist or whatever. I don't um, have this. And then a lot of people will gump, jump onto their keyboards. And, you know, obviously, and then that further propels the argument. But sometimes it's time to, your reaction 
to the article, it might be telling, there might be something that's subconscious that, you know, you might have to face mm-hmm. and just have a moment of self-reflection to think about it. So on the issue of, of existential issues, when you think when that phrase comes, when you say that phrase, what comes to mind? Um, and you know, so let's start with that. Like, what, what do you consider like existential issues that you find interesting? I think that's a difficult thing. I th- think probably as a mathematics major, sometimes I think about, um, cause I did do a particular series where I explored the, um, the, the nature of existence of our numbers. Um, so what's real and, um, and what's human created? Because, um, obviously a lot of things in society, they've been, there because they've been socially constructed whereas some things exist regardless of our nature and um that's part of the so we're questioning the nature of our own existence so um people who question their gender and they're going through the transformation process um you know um in transgender issues that's that's an existential um i think situation where people are finding their the nature of their own existence within a larger social sphere Mm. And also the conflict that comes up when you are presented, let's say, growing up with a binary, <clears throat> and then you're presented with new information that shows it's a spectrum and the crises, you know, that that can create. Yes, because I've, I mean, as a, because um, I've always known that I was, well, I kind of knew that I was asexual as a child, but that word wasn't invented. And so... Um, when I was finally found out what that word was, um, it was comforting. But then there's um, there's probably a number of other labels that I could have used at the time, like certain non-binary labels to describe what I go through. But because I've been around for so long, I'm just I'm kind of reluctant to engage in those labels for myself. But if other people don't really, I mean, that's that's what they want to do. Yeah, I think from you know one of the from my side as I. Um, left religion and went into atheism. One of the things that I found interesting were talks by Lawrence Krauss, and occasionally Dawkins will talk about this too, which is um, these moments of awe and wonder, uh, the moments where you do the calculations and you try to fathom how long ago um, the big expansion was or how big the universe is or just even the distance to like the next nearest um, you know, universe or uh, galaxy from us. I don't know, I know all the scientific terms, but um, it, those moments that you feel, you know, very small within something much more grand, being literally in awe, you know, awesome, which is what the word initially meant to us, you know, to be filled with awe. And what do you do oh, in those yes. moments? You know, and how do you handle those moments? Yeah. Um, so I think I remember. I think my, with my first teaching job, because when I started, because I majored in mathematics and then I was trained as an educator in that mathematics and I moved into the middle of Australia. Um, a lot of people know that Australia, it's only settled around the coast. So when you go into the inside, it's almost a vast plainness and the land was so flat and so barren, um, almost like a desert. And for the first time, you could actually see that the earth is a round sphere because of the nature of the flatness of the earth. And you realize that you're surrounded by this nothingness and um it was almost a certain cosmic reality kind of hits in yeah and i think that that's something one of the trends in the atheist community or at least the skeptic we'll call it the skeptic community is that whole mantra about um reels not feels and this is a classic problem that goes you know all the way back to you know the enlightenment um the thinkers that when we started to do more scientific processes in the 1600s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, there was an emphasis put on rationality and that sort of really subsumed emotion. And so this distance, this ability to observe this, you know, sort of stoic nature, it was, was rarefied logic and reason and maths and evidence and proof. But of course, we're not Vulcans. Uh, we also have emotions and our, our emotions you know, guide our morality far more than, you know, let's say a logical deduction. You know, we are guided primarily by how we feel about moral situations. So we have to acknowledge both parts of the human existence. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, Tom, have you had like an experience like that, like a profound? Oh, yeah, ma- uh, many times. Uh, 
I'm having trouble thinking of a specific event or time, but uh, probably camping uh, in the world, uh, you know, uh, like up in Boundary Waters or uh, oh, yes. in uh, the Apostle Islands on the, the side away from uh, Bayfield, away from lights. And uh, you can see the, in, in, like on Stockton Island, uh, camping on the north side of Stockton Island, you can see the whole horizon and uh, of the lake, and it's just gorgeous. Uh, and you look up and you see stars that you don't see anyplace else. Um, and it's you know there. That to me is one of the uh, one of the sort of uh, transcendent. Uh, events in my life. Um, when I when I think of uh, when I want to relax or go to a happy place, there's a there's a, a place in Boundary Waters that has a very small. Um, well, it's kind of a rapids uh, or uh, water, you know, an easy waterfall between two lakes, and uh, I just the 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 uh, sound of the uh, the water flowing be, uh, flowing on there um, was, uh, you know, it just takes me to a very comforting and wonderful, uh, peaceful place, but also deep inside. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things that are, that I find. Uh, I remember. Awesome and transcendent. Yeah. I remember as a, a girl when I was, because we lived in a very rural area, central Wisconsin, very far away from, well, far enough away from light pollution to see the band of the Milky Way, you know, that sort of cluster mm -hmm. of lighter area in the sky at night. And when someone pointed out that that's what it was, and I thought about the pictures from space and the arm, you know, the sort of the spiraling out of, of the, the Milky Way, and that's what I was seeing in the sky, that blew my mind. Um, mm -hmm. But as an adult, and now I guess I kind of think of it a little bit like, you know, there's a there's this carousel ride <laughs> that's going through time, and it's been going for billions of years, and it'll keep going for billions after. And I just get on at a little point in the early 1970s, and I get to ride it. When I read history or when I read science books, uh, the thing that you know, I'm very, I'm, of course, living too in Europe, you get, you, you walk past Roman mm -hmm. walls. Um, so you have the, the history, um, you could reach out and touch it, you know, like mm -hmm. thousands of years in the past. And so knowing all those stories or a lot of those stories that have gone before me, um, yeah, I, it feels like I'm just getting this, like a, just a, a match light of, mm -hmm. of time. Uh, but I get that amount of time. So that's sort of as an atheist without a lot of spirituality, one way to live. So. Well, one of the things about living when we do, though, is that we have, we, uh, since the invention of writing and then the printing press and now the, uh, uh, the Internet and instantaneous communication around the world, um, sometimes it's a little lag, but not yeah. much instantaneous. Um, I mean, you have you have hangouts with people in uh, in New Zealand, kind of, you know, without without any difficulty, um, and it's just really um, that that brief bit. Where am I? There you go. That brief lit little bit on the carousel. Mine is maybe more like that because I'm ancient. Um, but you the got a head start on me. Well, yeah, but the carousel number is just about infinite from our mm -hmm. point of view. So uh, that is that little bit difference is pretty much irrelevant. But we have access to knowledge about all these other parts of the world. Uh, I mean, of our history and of the world and of the universe and of uh, this handsome guy who is now on on uh, camera. Hello, yeah. woman. <laughs> Yeah, I felt it was good to, um, because it was such a, I felt a bit cold having the one with the, um, just the usual, like, avatar, whatever it was. <laughs> I felt like I was a little bit, um, distant from everyone. Well, it's, it's nice to see your face. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, most of the time I have, I, I can't figure out how to work my camera. So most of the time I have just my, my icon of, the, of my, of me idiotly smiling up into the uh, camera. So, um, you're lucky, unlucky. I don't know. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's incredible the idea that you can, um, the, the, the internet, how it's created the, this sort of, um, the, I guess the level of friendship and connection, um, to the other side of the world. It's that, that's the upside, but then the downside is the, um, the instantaneous response. Um, cause we used to have to spend a lot more time. Um, like we'd have to write a letter to the editor or like to our local newspaper to get our thoughts heard. And so we had to put more time into crafting whatever our arguments were and edit it. And now we can just say whatever we like at the spur of the minute. And, and for that reason, sometimes we do get it wrong as well. Mm -hmm. I think with the internet, like with all things before, time is going to be the great sifter. You know, because if you go back, I was watching a documentary about books and the history of the printing press. And of course, you know, when the printing press was first invented, it was revolutionary. People could disseminate ideas quickly and pornography because <laughs> that's what we do with technology. If we can figure out a way to have, make it have, uh, like help us have sex. Uh, that's what we're 34. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But, um, because it's since the, the writing, since the invention of the printing press, there have been lots and lots of books and pamphlets. People would just, you know, print stuff all the time. There's you know, writings by the levelers in the UK or in Britain, England, I should say, um, like during the coming into the uh, Cromwell's time. And people have been writing all these pamphlets and you can go and read them, but most of them are just shit. Most of them are really badly written. They're, they're not well argued. They're just, they're just, you know, people writing their thoughts in no really coherent way and in publishing it and you know, they could do it, but it doesn't, it doesn't stand the test of time. And I have a feeling, you know, like a lot of stuff on YouTube is going to end up in those, and there's just shelves. Like if you go to the British library, they'll pull out a rack of, you know, like they restored all of these antiques, you know, manuscripts, but they're not reproducing them because there's nothing in there worth <laughs> reading. So you have you have that um, sort of available to look at if you you know if you want to dig deep in you know paper stuff, but the stuff that's available, um, think of things like the uh, federal Federalist Papers, for instance. You know um, the uh, Patriot, um, the Crisis by uh, Thomas Paine. You know you get the um, you know things that do do stand the test of time. Um, hell, the, uh, uh, the old farm, the, uh, uh, Franklin's, uh, almanac. Oh, know, yeah. We still mm -hmm. have a bunch of them yet today. Um, so, I mean, th some things do. I think you're right. There is a sifter. And that's, you know, what, what actually people go back to and look at, uh, that's relevant yet today. Or relevant to their issue at that point, whether it's rel relevant to anybody else, mm -hmm. if it's available, you you know you you, you check it out, and that that those views make it more uh, reasonable for people to uh, keep those keep those sorts of things available and expand that sort of thing available that sort of things availability. Can you understand anything I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I was just thinking. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, 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 my, my teeth. Well, my teeth are. You know, I'm, I got new teeth, and this is. Uh, I I hear myself, and I sound. Uh, uh, funny. Anyway. We think you sound great. You can edit that that crap mm -hmm. out. You know, if you like. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> So you want to come back on that, uh, LW, at all, on um, this notion of time sifting things out? Yes, I guess it'll be telling. Um, what I what I hope is that there are certain um, there are certain parts of the internet um, that are a little bit more dissident than others. Um, like for whatever reasons they are, that that some of their ideas will um, inspire other ideas, and I can I can find like minded individuals because at the moment I'm kind of in a um, a part of the internet, like sort of an ideology that's very, very specific. Um, so, namely, it's like a a wing of a wing of MRA that takes on the pro-feminist stance, 
which is um like luckily I've been contacted by people um who are inter- who also share that view as well. Um now the only other channel I can think of um was Captain Miku. Mm-hmm. I think um you might be familiar with that. Um so when I unfortunately yeah, he's, awesome. he's not a YouTube Miss him. yeah unfortunately he's not a YouTube but that's probably Miss the him. closest that's probably mm-hmm. the closest to what um what my mission is as well to try and um I guess to get it away from that um, that reactionary Paul Elam kind of wing of MRA, that's my worst enemy, and yeah. more enemies in that um, the so-called anti SJW. I mean, that's where the rude comments come from. I mean, as, as the Wooly Bumblebee said, the my interactions with this part of the um, internet, um, like there's never been, um, it's nothing but friendly. Like people have been very nice to me on this side of it. Yeah, I mean, we're not, if for all the terrible things they say about us, we're we're really not as terrible as they make us out to be. Um, but of course, that doesn't do clicks. But we don't want to talk about that. Let's focus on. Uh, I I just did a, an episode of. Yeah, I did an episode of um, Feminist Talk Back, and one of the people. Now, both of the guests actually are are, and I am supportive of uh, you know, advancing men's issues, and I prefer issues to rights because not a, it's not always a legal thing. I do as well. Yeah, it's, it can be a no, social no. thing or an economic thing or whatever else. So issues is better than rights. And it's too first wave feminist for me to focus just on rights. Um, but Rez was um, also saying, you know, that she's a big uh, advocate of, of men's issues in that way. And, you know, where when is an issue feminist and all this kind of stuff? And my take was if there's an issue that tends to disproportionately affect women, you know, then it's like a feminist issue because it's dealing with something that women experience, right? But that doesn't mean then you bring in the intersectionality and you go, okay, here's how women experience it and they experience it disproportionately, but men experience it or trans people experience it and how do they experience it so that we can create solutions that work for everybody? You know, like the issue oh, okay. of the draft, you know, like the issue of the draft is a men's issue. But as a as a woman and a feminist, I can sort of make arguments that drafting anybody against their will, man or woman, is wrong. And so I think, you know, finding those areas where you can be um, an ally. I, I think my job is to be an ally without taking over the issue. I think it's my job to help people yes. step up and support them, not speak for them, you know, or s- tell the stories I hear that um, other people have said rather than me judging other people in that way so i think that's how you be a a good ally and i do think that it's too bad that so often um it's been a dichotomous pity of issues rather than saying how do these issues affect each sex and now and that we're you know intersectionality trans people differently let's look at the ways that this problem can be manifest and try to account for all of them in our policy solutions there is yeah with the specific um I guess I can call it my ammo because I really appreciate the fact that feminists say this is my branch of feminism. So that's really what I do with MRA. I say this is my version of it just so that you can own your own particular ideology, um, different ideology. But there's, it's adapted a little bit from the intersectionality that, that obviously, um, comes from feminism in that I think it's important. Um, I guess the underrepresentation of trans men. And that's something um, Micaiah really talks to very much. Um, and I think it's a matter of, you know, I guess being an ally to that, um, but also to trans women as well. I mean, you're being an ally to women if you're taking a pro-feminist part of MRA as well and just kind of listening to what the what the issues are. So that's why you'll watch and subscribe to a lot of other content just so that you can hear the stories that, um, that you might hear otherwise. So I don't know if Tom has anything he wants to add on there, but I'm kind of curious as to, yeah, like the positive reactions you get. And do you, do you think you get more of them than people know about? Are there more people out there that um, kind of agree with your method and perspective than is represented on YouTube? Yes. Um, I think the biggest irony is that for someone who's that, that an MRA channel has more viewership from feminists than any other group in um, YouTube. And it's probably, like some of it's to do with the social affiliations because I'm very good friends with the the anarchist part of feminist, which I didn't, I never thought I'd see myself in that circle. But they kind of took me under my wing, and they're trying to turn me into a. Um, I don't want to get arrested. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of scared. I'm scared. <laughs> like I'm not. I don't want to throw bricks. So I'm going to lose my teaching license. But 
I agree with the socialism and probably Owen McDonald is the one that I'm, because I had a great hangout with him and he's the one, I think, I think politically I'm kind of on the same side as him is like very much pro socialism. Um, and critique of capitalism almost comes into every aspect of the, because we had a conversation about many things and it, it always came back to a critique of capitalism and class structure. But I think, um, there are, other places, there's a closed book on Facebook, which they call themselves moderate MRAs, which is um, they're not going to automatically make that false dichotomy thinking that um, there's got to be one side that's um, it's one side versus the other and one side has to be destroyed for the other ones. Words should be good. Feminism should be a good thing. MRA should be a good thing. But unfortunately, um, it's, it's suffered so much um I guess damage under the I guess the leadership, especially of ones like um Paulie Lamb and um and the experience I had on Facebook, the there's a page called I think it's Men's Rights Universe or whatever, and there's absolutely nothing like there's no content in there that has any relation like there's maybe one or two good things, but it's all negative and um and they're selling merchandise and mm. Um, I bathe in feminist tears. So that's obviously playing on the, um, the radical side that it says, you know, male tears. And so they've put the response, you know, feminist tears and they're selling MGTOW, um, merchandise as well, like a hat. And I'm thinking, you know, they've always been enemies of each other, like MRA, MGTOW. There's, there's been a very, um, we've never really gotten along. <laughs> And so, um, and to see that, and I guess that's what inspires people to start channels when you see that, um, when you want to create content that you're kind of missing out on when you look at other, other websites on Facebook. That's why you want to, um, make a comment so you can specifically talk about those. There's some men's activists that will talk specifically about custody agreements or whatever, but that's not really something that I can speak very much from. Um, I'm sort of relying on other people's stories. Um, I mainly speak to depression and just and just generally um, just generally happiness. I and mean, that's the uh, for for men and women. Um, we want to seek, I guess, happiness at the end of the day. Um, and some of the videos can be very um, kind of more lighthearted than others. You might. Um, I'm thinking of starting a um, doing a video called you know why life began at 30. So it's kind of challenging that norm that after the age of 30, like the the virility kind of drops and. And women as well, they go through the same thing. There's a stereotype. So I'm just going to relate, you know, from my personal anecdote, like why why I believe that my life began at the age of 30. Well, it's weird being asexual, though, because that's um, I can't really speak for people who've had that kind of um, virility and they've enjoyed that sexual promiscuousness or whatever, but I can still relate um, in other ways. I, I do believe that a lot of things happened after the age of 30. That's when I... Um, I got my first tattoos at the age of 30. Um, like I started trying to teach myself the piano at the age of 30 and taught myself to crochet. So a lot of the things that I'm really proud of, they happened after that age. And so that's a video that I'd love to be able to produce for, um, for other men and really relate to women's issues as well. Um, because I try to invite women into the audience to say, you know, um, is this something that affects you as well? So um, as a woman, like how do you, does this affect you as well? That kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, I like the idea of the video of life starting at thirty, especially <laughs> Tom. Do you <laughs> would you push it back? Would you say fifty? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I uh, in I only have my experience to go by, but um, until I was about sixty, maybe even sixty-five, um, I felt like I I felt like I was, you know, I felt like I did when I was in my twenties. You know, I didn't, uh, my self-image anyway was that, I, you know. But now uh, uh, I started to feel my age in the last few years, and that's, you know, teeth and uh, shoulder surgery and all the rest of it. My eyes went bad, and I got surgery from them, for them, and now that's better. Um, speaking of this, this carousel of time, I'm glad I'm on, on it here <laughs> because – the, the surgeries that I've had for my eyes and my shoulder and all that kind of stuff uh, were either not available, you know, a few, uh, 
two decades ago or were major, major surgeries with a lot of, a lot of potential for fucking up big time. And now it's, uh, you know, it's day surgery. You go in, you, you know, spend a couple, you know, 20 minutes under the knife. You come out and uh, go home and heal up. That's amazing. So, uh, mm-hmm. Tom, just out of curiosity, I was wondering, because I'm hearing some background from you. If you could check your settings to see if you're on communications or on your preferred mic, just because uh, we're getting a little bit of feedback. But we're still hearing you loud and clear. Just if we could okay, hear you better, that'd be great. Which, uh, yeah, in, the, in the settings uh, bar, there's the um, the one with the the tool thingy. You can check which microphone you're using. I think we okay, maybe had this yeah. problem. But just make sure it's not on communication. So that's the bad one. I'll edit this bit out. Uh, <laughs> which one do you want? Oh, okay. Um, Whatever one is your preferred mic. If it's on your webcam or another one, just pick the ones that that show up. So, yeah, and, and too, I guess you know that I can see that you know what you're saying about how you felt in yourself in your 20s. You felt like you said to the 65. I'm still in that place. I think. What when uh, when LW was talking about um, life beginning at thirty, I, I could relate because I too had real anxiety about turning thirty. And then when it happened, it wasn't that bad. And then after I kind of got over it, I realized, oh, I'm financially set. I'm actually independent for the first time in my life. I can do a lot of these things, and I'm less concerned about other people's opinions. I'm more interested in what makes me happy. And pursuing those things rather than pursuing things that make me look good in the eyes of others. Not that I ever really did that, but um, there's always the social pressures, I think, you know, to conform and to look a certain, at least for, you know, women, uh, look a certain way or, you know, be a certain personality um, to, to get noticed or get attention. And I just stopped caring about all those things. And the older I get the less I care about. And it makes me infinitely happier. I don't mean I don't care about issues. Like I don't care about the petty things. And for me, it was also about 30 when I had the confidence to really walk away from those kinds of internal pressures. Yes. I think, I guess every epoch of our, every single era of our lives, I guess it's a, it's not really so much a loss of something um, because that's how we, how society has sort of made us feel, I guess, in a capitalistic world where, we're sold so many images and promises or whatever and all these beauty products, um, you know, for, and it affects men and women in such different ways. So we have gendered kind of solutions, but I guess we need to shift to the idea of um, instead of losing something, we gain something from um, becoming older and I guess every era. So the next challenge I face is um, I'm 37 now, so I'm three years close to 40. So, you know, what does being, what does 40 years old mean to me? And, um, and so there's an opportunity. Um, I have to. I have to think of it as okay. This is a, um, this is a reinvention time. So it's um. So what about me? Am I going to reinvent for that particular age? Mm. Yeah, I, and th- I think that you're right because we do keep changing, you know, and we keep evolving. Things happen in in the course of our lives, and we react to them. And we become different people. So yeah, well, yeah. Uh, and. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You, Tommy, then I'll talk after you. You go first. <laughs> well, about uh, the uh, landmarks in my life. At, at, t- at 30, I uh, had a two-year-old son who was married and um, living in uh, Ashland. No. no. By that time, we were living in uh, just uh, about 20 miles out of Hayward on a lake, you know, beautiful out in the sticks was wonderful for me anyway. And um, so that 30 was, I think 30 might have been one of those years that I I forgot how old I was. You know, sometimes I went through a whole year thinking I was a different age, either older or younger. It was like, (laughs) oh, geez, you know, it just wasn't that big a deal. At 40, I had been, I was divorced. I had been to to grad school in Madison for uh, uh, two years in archaeology, and that uh, didn't work out. I had I had a drinking problem. got got better for that. From that, and went into uh, grad school in Menominee at Stout for uh, counseling. Um, So I had I got by 
my 40th birthday, I was in the middle of a program for getting a, my master's degree in counseling. Uh, and then, you know, the rest of the rest of that year, that, that time, I was busy going, you know, getting into a, into a groove. Um, and then I, and then my, uh, depression started hitting. And for the next, well, from then, from like the, the late nineties until now, uh, I've been just, it's just been coasting. And, um, I wish it was different, but it wasn't. And so, a uh, lot, like I say, a lot of what's been going on for me is, uh, I didn't notice any real difference, uh, in, in my self image, uh, other than the depression, uh, at 60 than I did at, at, uh, 25 or so. And then the last few years with the physical things and then, um, in the depression, I've, you know, then it started going sort of, Downhill, and I, this last couple of years have been a lot of uh, uh, deaths in, in the uh, family, uh, cousins, and you know, I, like I was talking about earlier, my my son's stepfather, uh, things like that. So, um, yeah, I don't remember where I was going with that. By the way, is my sound any better? Um, it's okay. It's about the same, but it's okay. I can fix it in post. I can fix it in post. It's all okay. Right. We'll start it out. You know, I know that, um, Lonely Wolf, that was actually, you know, issue of depression and also the intersection of age, I think was something we previously talked about that you yes. had an interest um, in. I think that's, yes. In, in my MRA, I have a particular, I've kind of expanded that because initially it was just age and gender that I was talking about, but I've sort of, um, I mean, I have the opportunity to kind of, um, I guess to bring to light the indigenous Australian issues of what happened and the idea of a intergenerational trauma. Um, and sometimes we have to do things spiritually when we're, um, if we're trying to understand other cultures and to be mindful of those, we do have to understand a bit about spirituality. Um, but I think age was a very important thing. Um, I think it's because the norms, I think the, the older, um, our men and women are, the more likely they are to conform to very strict kind of gender roles. And so, um, there's obviously a lot of I try to think of programs, um, and I guess the the trauma of entering into retirement as well must be something that's very difficult for a lot of people. Um, so men and women who are who are very active their whole life, and like one of the stereotypes of men is that they're perceived to be active and providers, and then that day comes when they retire, and they think, oh yeah, this is going to be great. It's going to be like fishing trips and that. And I've seen my own dad go through that, but unfortunately, the reality is it's a little bit of a shell shock. They don't. Um, so we try to think, okay, the ideas that we um, had for um, people of that generation, at least my father's generation of the sixties. So, um, like, how can we actually um, help them make that transition? And his, uh, he, I guess, his story was charity. He does a lot of. Um, he does a little bit of volunteer work. In the aged care so that was a big bonus for him and i guess it was expanding his hobby city huts <clears throat> yeah i know that when i go back to wisconsin if i'm driving around you know like early in the morning and i stop <laughs> off for coffee um invariably there will be a a, a clatch of men uh, older men in the mm -hmm. corner doing their coffee corners <laughs> yep. tom's yeah, now you're nodding your head and i think yep. that does speak to that that importance of connection mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, Tom, you want to go? Nope. I, I had to cough. I, yeah, I, I don't <laughs> really have a, 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 that's true. There are, my neighbor, for instance, every, um, every uh, morning, almost every morning goes down to the, uh, we don't have coffee shops. I live in a town of 350 people. We have bars and churches. That's uh, that's what you have in Wisconsin. You have bars and churches in small towns. Mm -hmm. So one of, one of the bars in um, in town is um, has a sort of a restaurant. Actually, they have pretty good food. It's a very nice. Um, it's a dive, but it's a very nice dive, and they uh, they have very good bar food. And so they he go he he goes with his brother and and other friends, and uh, they. They chat for a couple hours every morning, and uh, I've been invited to that 
I was invited to that very early on. And uh, I declined partly because I am a little bit shy and, and not very social in a lot of uh, a lot of ways, but also because I know people around here, and I know that the uh, discussions they would get into, the political discussions, the uh, discussions about um, men and women, um, probably not religion, and certainly not sports, because I would agree with them on all the sports. Um, we're all Packer fans here. So, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and yes. Packer, Wisconsin, <laughs> and Brewers. And, okay. Yeah, go Pack. I was I was almost thinking about wearing my Packers shirt this morning. <laughs> and then um, didn't. But no, I, it, that's, that's, absolutely, that's absolutely the case. There are, um, I think, you go, uh, when, I, when I go in and take my car in to get fixed in town, there's um, Burger King. I can't remember. Yeah, I think the Burger King near the uh, repair shop. So I go in there and have a little breakfast. And there's uh, there's always at least one table of guys mm -hmm. sitting and bullshitting and um, not really caring a lot about how loud they are or, or who hears what they have to say. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely that's absolutely the case. And you talk about we they and they will and they will often be. Not often, but sometimes they'll be talking about how women gossip. You know, you know, oh, my wife the other day, you should hurt. She got oh. some gossip. And let me tell <laughs> These you, guys going, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes, they, yes. yes, I mean, you should see. I mean, um, like when I hang out, because I sometimes do live streams with the – um, it's Ross. He's the American anarchist and the vegan anarchist and the whole the whole crew. And it just – it. Because it's usually a milestone, so someone's had their you know hundredth subscriber, or it's a birthday, or whatever, <laughs> and, and yeah, it does. It it is very. We become very gossipy. Um, like I'm still trying to figure out how they, how I became sort of in their um, circle of friends. I don't. I think it was because we met through the the Russian Deadpool from the Skeptic Feminist, and then I'd met um the and we had a few things in common, like I, I guess a similar sense of humor. I think. And so when we go on live, it is very gossipy. And I, I mean, imagine what a, um, a men's like um, like knitting circle would look like, which I think should be a thing. I think that would be a brilliant. I wish, I wish, I'd love to see those kind of things happen. Because I, I mean, at the moment, I'm just a solitary little um, like crochet enthusiast. But I think I'd love to have those like um, open. I mean, imagine what men would be the have gossipy we'd get if we had the um. Because in Australia we call it the Stitch and Bitch Club. If you yeah, get yeah, together, Stitch and Bitch. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Stitch and bitch. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's like um, I'm trying to say. All right, so Tim, um, you know Kevin, um, you know it's easy. Like just learn to do some things, and then you can join Chrissyosity because she's she's also a very good proficient. So we'll have like we'll have the Stitch and Bitch stream. <laughs> <laughs> well, do it, like a live stream. Oh God. Yeah, I can do scarves. That's it. As long as it's just row after row after row, I can't. Uh, and that's. As long as as long as you can do a hobby craft, that's fine. We yeah. can get like YouTubers getting together, and we'll have just a massive like stitch. We can have a <laughs> stitching bitch stream. <laughs> I like that idea. We'll have to organize it. Although I tend to knit more in the winter months because it's just for me, it's like a winter activity because I need this, the scarf. But oh, we can do it uh, in the autumn yeah. leading up to it. Mm. Yeah, I I did it in the summer actually because I knew that I was going to run out of time because it's like by the time I finish something. It ends up getting to the stage where um, <clears throat> it's already warm again. So I think, okay, well, I'm going to have to like put this thing away. So I started in like the middle of summer. <laughs> right. And so now it's like um, I'm starting to get cold and now it's like timing is perfect. That's good. Yeah. my Your timing makes a lot more sense because then you're done when you need it. Whereas mm -hmm. by the time I'm yeah. done, it's halfway through the winter. But yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, getting back to that, like the, the idea of society and, you know, um, cause I mean, all right, so I'm, I'm like 20 years away from retirement, but I think about retirement a lot. I think I'm really looking forward to retirement, at least like, the idea of it, you know? Um, but yeah. I do see where isolation would be a huge issue. Uh, and increasingly one, you know, um, you know, if you're, if your kids move away and it's, it's distant, all of these things, cause we're increasingly a mobile society, um, 
And, and so, yeah, it's just, you know, other people might be moving away or going to Florida for half of the year if you live in Wisconsin to, to get away from the winter. And if you stay behind, well, then you're, you don't see your friends down in the, in whatever, where you, where you go to see them. So, yeah, I think that that's, um, it's a, it's a, a lot of a challenge that I don't know if a lot of people recognize, um, or kind of plan for. Yeah. So that's something I kind of, I actually, made a video about just that specific topic about how to um i guess um what what tools we have and i guess one of the i guess the internet is a very powerful tool because it opened up with youtube there's so many tutorials where if you want to pick up a new hobby you can learn that so there's um hopefully there's a program that when they sell computers or whatever they got a free kind of training workshop for older people so that they can um good at using that technology because that will open up a new world for them and especially with Kindle or eBooks, they can reconnect with a lot of old literature that they might have loved without having to, you know, go to a bookstore or whatever. So I think the provision of um, training for those who can't do that could be a big um, benefit. And the other thing too, and it may be the case, you know, in, in places like maybe Australia and New Zealand, I've only been to Sydney, so I can't really speak to much else of Australia. But in the States, of course, you've got these big tracts of land and people live far apart. In Europe, it's quite different. You know, in Germany, they have like Wohngemeinschaft, where they have like mixed living. And so you might, you get, you know, maybe a young family and some seniors, but it's more communal. Like it's more of a shared yes. space rather than everybody just avoiding on contact with their neighbor other than to say hello when you're checking the post and like, no, go away. Um, and so, uh, and a lot of people in Europe also, because of there's less space, they'll rent a room to a student. Right. Or they'll have shared accommodation because they can afford a house, to, you know, like two women. If she rents out the room, someone her age, then they can afford to, to keep the house. And so the idea of moving in with people and, and sharing space is much more common in Europe than in the U.S. And I remember when my grandmother, after my grandfather died, she lived alone for uh, quite a long time, but then eventually her health was just a little too sketchy. So she moved into an assisted living center where she had her own place, but there were people on site in case there were any problems. And she lived like you know, about a five minute walk away from the senior center. And we would go to visit her and she'd be on her own. And, you know, I once asked her, I'm like, grandma, you're just indoors all day. Why don't you go over to the senior center and you know do things over there? She's like, that's for old people. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think um, yeah. I think I'm already because I live. I mean, every most of my hobbies are kind of they're, they're kind of stereotypically associated with old people. Um, so namely, like there's the hobby craft, like the um, like the crochet hook and everything. But like, I also prefer to play the bingo over the other. Um, like we call them poker machines or pokies, whereas you'd call them slot machines in the states. Yeah, but um machines. Yeah. yeah slot machines yeah that's 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 an instant gratification um kind of thing where there's a sudden win or a sudden loss but um i prefer the game of just playing the bingo itself um because that release of whatever hormones that uh whatever endorphins or whatever it's a very slow gradual release and if you're one number off getting your number called out there's um the levels uh like up here they've gradually built up to a high level so that should, I think, bingo should be the replacement drug for those who are gambling addicts because you're only paying for your tickets. It'd be like, it could be very big, yeah. But yeah, that's so like shuddering a lot of stereotypes, <laughs> like shuddering stereotypes. But it's becoming more common amongst youths, especially on cruises, because a lot of people go on cruises now, and that's the bingo addiction, or it's not an addiction, but the bingo enthusiasm originates from going on cruises. It's a perfect game for a cruise, right? You just have a big empty yeah. empty dining room anyway, and all you need yes. is a bunch of balls and a microphone and some cards. Not that expensive, yes. and no one's going to fall over and break an ankle mm -hmm. like during the dance lessons. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. very safe. Boy, I have the wrong idea of cruises. I'm, you know, from for me thinking about going on a cruise, I I would imagine myself on the on the sun deck, just looking at the ocean and. You know, on, on the stern, looking at the wake. Getting back to that notion of I mean, awe. Oh, for who wanted yeah, to? I mean, yeah. yeah, you're you're you know you're you're at sea, and then you spend all your time inside. Yes, that's the culture. I had the I had I had the wrong idea entirely. Just uh, well, the only cruise I was on was an Alaskan cruise in July, 
And it was still, even though uh, the room I was in was a, had a balcony, I mean, the balcony was basically the size of double doors uh, extended yeah. out a little bit. So you get to kind of get two chairs and uh, then your knees are bumping up against the railing. So, I mean, but you still got to sit out there and I had to like bring three blankets and a hat, like to read a book. I'm like, this is miserable. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to look back yeah. inside. But um, yeah, if you did a, so that was beautiful, but it wasn't, I would have said I wasn't sunbathing on the Lido deck and and that cruise. Um, But yeah, I think another one I would probably be more likely to be uh, near the pool or just on it, just um, being at sea um, in that way. But you must, you can get maybe bored of sitting around and then there's shuffleboard and eating and gambling and bingo. So there you go. (laughs) Yeah. Not the, not the bingo that gets played on the internet in, in certain, we won't mention that type of thing. This is the real. This one with numbers. <laughs> this is yeah. A, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that has any bearing on the current situation. The current discussion. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> That's the quick go. Very very tough. droll. Very droll. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the um, uh, what is it, Tim? I think that was uh, um, it was probably the funniest video. The the wedding video was fantastic. Just the um. <laughs> He turned it into this creepy um, kind oh, of um, yeah. like an abstract work of art. It's um, and some people took it literally, saying, "Oh, he's so paranoid about the um, about exposing their guests," but they don't realize it was a satire. That's exactly what it was. It was a hyperbole or a satire yes. on the idea of people being paranoid about identities and all these figures that came about. And yeah, Tim is a great. I mean, I I think personally, <laughs> I think Creation is Cat is probably the the Mm, he's a performance artist to me more than anything. I know people mm-hmm. kind of think of him as a ponage channel, but he does so many of his videos in a way that you could see both sides of a critique. You know, is he critiquing mm-hmm. this side or is he yes. critiquing that side? And he kind of ends up critiquing everybody and you. Um, so I, I enjoy his performance art. And then, I mean, obviously he's got a whole theme up there, but Tim too, he's got a really interesting take on the world. And I always enjoy his videos because he's he's quite original and quite thoughtful and and he does that kind of stuff. You know, he'll just do something to the extreme, but not say, point at it, hey, look at how mm. much I did on this. He'll just leave it like his. He did a, a fake apology to somebody, and people just took it at face value because they didn't. Yeah. So Tim's stuff is yeah. really enjoyable. I can't. I I don't have the capacity to do that because I'm kind of like um because Owen McDonald and I we're both um because we had such a good time in our hangout because. Because we both have a very similar, the way we frame our videos, it comes from a very kind of, um, you know, because I call my MRA the kind of golden Labrador MRA, just like the wagging tail, so the welcoming wagging tail and mm-hmm. everything. And that's how, and that's his, um, and with his feminism and his socialism, he greets it the same way, a sort of gentle approach. So we're both kind of very serious about that. But I guess sometimes when we're in hangouts, I can be a little bit um, more, I can be a little bit more relaxed, but when it comes to videos, I wouldn't be capable of that kind of satirical mm-hmm. character playing. I was impressed in um, in Tim talking about performance art and reactions to it. I was impressed in Tim's uh, wedding video about how creative the uh, the comments were. Many of the comments were, you know, you got a lot. You got, you know. You got your wife from the, you know, from Minecraft. You know, you built her out of Minecraft's uh, pieces, you know. And, and the, the, <laughs> I really enjoyed the uh, the comment section. Like you say, there were some, or quite a few that didn't get the joke or or, or wanted to attack because of who he was. But uh, a lot of people really had fun with it. I thought that was kind of neat. How could you take that literally as someone like that anyone where any person in their right mind would be that um paranoid? I mean, I, I thought it was it was almost a work of art as like an abstract art yeah. to me. <laughs> he did say um that he spent quite a long time, you know, doing yeah. every single person in the shot. And so yeah, mm. it was quite the time consuming, you know, like he yeah. was creating a piece of Yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, uh, going with each face and, you know, sort of blurring it out or, or just blacking out, you know, faces. It was, 
it was all kinds of different shapes. It was, you know, abstract art, like you said. It was, uh, yeah. it was creepy as hell. <laughs> and it kind of, the, the creepiness kind of descended and it kind of, um, you know, it reminds me of this video series, um, Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. It's kind of like that kind of, um, the shock value of this, this gradual build up into this nightmarish kind of world. Well, it started off a little bit weird, but then the, the, the sound distortion just kept getting up and up and up. And it's like, mm-hmm. this could go viral. This could be a viral wedding video. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just to, I mean, um, so yes, Tim, you're brilliant. You big love fest, love yeah. bombs going Tim's way. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah, you go ahead, Tom. If you're on, I'm going to go off topic. So if you're still on topic, go ahead. No, I'm. I was. Uh, let me see. Who was that? Hand grenade. Love oh, bombs. Yeah. <laughs> love hand grenade. <laughs> there you go, Tim. That was just for you. <laughs> from Tom to you. <laughs> um, yeah, the scariest thing I saw was actually a, a short video directed by like a friend of a friend of a friend. You know, one of those things that you get on Facebook, like my cousin's second, you know, uh, my second cousin's wife has made this thing and it's being voted on. Please, everybody support it. But and I feel I'm, I'm really torn. Like, I want you to watch it. But I think if I describe it, it will be just as creepy. So <clears throat> here it goes. If you don't want to hear it, spoiler alert, I'll try to find the video and put it in link below. Is anybody, oh, are you guys going to be disappointed if I give you the spoiler? I, I think it's still going to be your mind's oh, eye. Okay. Able to do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it takes place in a child's bedroom at night, sort of um, kind of a stormy weather outside. And the child calls, you know, for his dad, dad, dad. And the dad wanders into the sort of you know, darkened child's bedroom. There's a little white boy, because he's white dad, uh, sitting uh, on his bed. He said, Dad, I think there's something under my bed. And the dad goes, oh, I'm sure there's not. He's like, but can you please check? And so the dad gets down on his knees, and he lowers his head. And so you see him kind of lowering his head down to the shot of between the floor and the bottom of the bed. And what he sees under the bed is his child going, I think there's somebody in my bed. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've seen that, that, might be doing. that was uh, <laughs> that was creepy. <laughs> and then it ends. And then it ends. It's like the lady and the tiger. You don't know what happens. Um, mm-hmm. I know. Is the lady and the tiger a really obscure reference? I know it. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's a short story about somebody who's doing a battle and he either is going to have like a, a lady come out or a tiger and, and, um, either he's going to get married or face the tiger. And the story ends before the door opens. So you don't know if it's going to be yeah. the lady or the tiger. And that's similar to this. Like you just see two identical, the same actor, obviously playing both roles, but then it just hits you. Like what, how do you react in that moment? Like who are you afraid mm-hmm. of? It's just really mm-hmm. creepy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So art, good art can instill yeah. that, um, mm. I guess, sublime, that horror, I guess, you know, gothic. I'm thinking now back to Byron and the landscapes of, of the art in that day when everything was about. Yeah, I sort of, um, I sort of think of um, uh, Coleridge is probably who I think about when I think of the origins. Or, um, and yeah. probably Edgar Allan Poe as well was something, um, or even, even some of Oscar Wilde's work, especially Doreen, there was a bit, there was a bit of a creepy element there. <laughs> yes. And that was definitely creepy. So. And hey, I think on that bombshell, we've been going for about an hour. And as fun as this is, I told you guys, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've got another hangout yeah. to do like in a bit. But this was so nice and relaxed and chilled. And, and I, yeah, I usually, it's usually more women in the room than me. So it's nice to be the minority. It was good to talk about these issues too. <laughs> It was, you know, it was nice because, um, uh, you know, a lot of times there's just, you know, the, the feminism and we focus on how it affects men, but I think we had more of a discussion focused on, on men's issues and why it's a, why it's a, yeah. So. It was good to like <laughs> smash the atheist, the atheist cucumber frame as well, saying, you know, we're not, we're not robots or Klingons. Like mm-hmm. we still, um, mm-hmm. you know, we, we still, um, talk about deep cosmic perspectives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Intersectional atheism. I, I do like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you to my guests for being here and for participating. Thanks to all my patrons. Quick thank note is that um, uh, because this month with the conference, everything, the holidays, it all just got away from me. But the winner of the April um, 
progressive fund is going to be going to secular counseling services. And that was again inspired by Eli Bosnick uh, when he was on my channel. Um, and so the winner is going to be uh, oh, supporting awesome. a network. That it's like forty dollars will go towards supporting people who are helping people who have uh, addiction needs or anything else find secular counseling rather than AA or other religious based uh, help. Mm -hmm. So um, May will be I'll do a video for May shortly and uh, I'll try to catch up. It's been crazy on my channel, you guys. Know. So anyway, <laughs> uh, thanks for watching to the audience. You guys have been awesome. Uh, oh wait, wait, I did that in the wrong order. Listening. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. My guests have been awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here. Still, don't don't, uh, don't leave the hangout. We'll have a little chat afterwards. But for the rest of you, I'll see you again really soon. Bye bye.